Thank you very much, Jacob. And well, good morning, everyone. Okay, live with that. Um, my name's Duncan Ross. As Jacob kindly said, I'm old. Um, in, in fact, the first time I was in Berlin was in November 1989. Uh, some stuff happened here then. Uh, as a student, I hasten to add. Uh, so it's great to be back here again. I've been working with data since the early 90s. In fact, I'm in this luxurious position of having a whole industry has moved towards me rather than me actively having to seek out an industry, which is a great position to be in. And uh, currently, I work in a day job for an organization called Times Higher Education. And we analyze universities. But I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about what I do in my spare time, which is working as a volunteer for a not-for-profit called Datakind UK. And that's led us into the area of data and ethics. So yes, this is an ethics lecture. <laughs> I've come to Germany, the home of Immanuel Kant, to talk about ethics. That seems a dangerous starting point for anything. So before we get much further in, let's just remind ourselves, not all data is big. Some of the most important data in the world is actually relatively small. Do not think just because you stick it in a Hadoop, it makes it more important. Okay. Not all learning is deep. Sometimes simple solutions are the best solutions. And was that a woo from the audience? <laughs> That's someone who hasn't worked out how to use uh, TensorFlow, isn't it? <laughs> and not all decisions are fair. And this is really the nub of this talk. You can use big data, you can do deep learning, but actually, we have to be aware of the impact of the decisions that we take, and that not all of those decisions will be fair. So a bit about this talk. Firstly, I, I originally started with this no formula, and then I looked at my slides and realized that that wasn't true. <laughs> Limited formula, okay? Definitely no code. My coding is really, really bad. Most of my coding is done in SQL, and I, by and large, I'm happy if I get a finite number of rows in my data set something above zero and below infinite. And I'm quite happy with the result of my coding. So there will be no coding, but there will be some interaction. Hands up if you have a smartphone with you. Hands up if you have a Nokia 3310 with you. <laughs> no? okay. uh, one person, good man. That's one of the weird things, by the way. I, I, do you remember the time when the most heard of sound in the universe was that Nokia ringtone? Every single place you went, it was there, and now you never hear, or very rarely hear it. So anyway, interaction. Get out your smartphones. Get them out, come on. Oh, okay, those of you who didn't already have them out. Get them out. Go to slido.com in your browser. And when you get to slido.com, it will ask you for a code. Type in Berlin Buzz with capital Bs. And then you will see your first question. And at this point, Nina, my helpful assistant, will activate the first question. So the first question is simply asking a little bit about yourselves. It's saying, are you a coder? Are you a data scientist? Are you, uh, what's the third option, coder, data scientist, architect? Or are you, do you have a bizarre job title uh, that doesn't really reflect in any of those elements? Can, anyone see, can everyone see that? Yes? Getting there? Give you another few minutes. Do we have some answers? Ooh. Has everyone voted? I need to hear some answers. I can't kind of guess that. Has everyone voted? No? A few more minutes then. By the way, this is the type of question we're going to be asking. It's not really that difficult. There's one maths question later which is a bit difficult, but I'll accept wrong answers for that. Who hasn't voted yet? You, keep, you can't, they can't change the answers, it's new answers coming in. <laughs> okay, we'll give a few more seconds. And then Nina, how are we doing? Data scientists, 10%. 10% data scientists. Architects, 22%. 22% architects. 57% coders. 57% coders. Wizard guru, influencer, genius, and 11%. 11% wizard guru, influencer, or genius. So actually there are far, slightly more genii <laughs> than there are data scientists. Which is interesting. Um, okay, we'll move on to the second question. This is a somewhat easier question. 
or not? We'll see. Are you good or evil? <laughs> now, there was a debate, should I allow a neutral, but this isn't Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, no chaotic neutrals amongst us, please. If you can't decide whether you're absolutely good or absolutely evil, just take whatever you're feeling closest to this morning. I appreciate that if I ask this after coffee, I might get a different answer. How are people getting on with this question? Has everyone voted? This isn't a difficult question. You shouldn't be spending much time thinking about this one. Okay, answers. 78% good, 23% evil. There's some rounding errors there. <laughs> okay. 101%, that's interesting. Okay, so broadly speaking, I'm, I'm talking to a good audience. That's excellent. Most of this will be useful for you. For those of you who are of an evil bent, just take the answers and uh, one minus the answer should get you where you want to be. Okay. So we've started the interaction. We'll come back to that later on. Before we move into the meat of the presentation, who are data kind? Datakind is a charity, a not-for-profit, who believe that actually we want to help other not-for-profits do data science. We believe that if people out there in the not-for-profit world could use data, they would make better decisions, they would be able to do more. But we know that that's difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, if you look, and this is taken from O'Reilly's uh, data science uh, uh, data salary survey, where do people in data science work? 21% work in consulting. If you're a consultant, put your hand up and willing to admit it. 18% uh, work in software. If you work in software, put your hand up. I'm expecting a forest of hands. That's more like it. Uh, banking, finance, etc. The problem is if you look at that cycle, where would not-for-profits appear? Here in the, the other section by and large. Only 3% of people who work in data science are actually working in the not-for-profit sector. And that's hugely problematic because it's a huge sector and they're dealing with some of the biggest challenges in the world. So how does Datakind work? Well, firstly, we work through volunteers, people who are willing to give their time pro bono to work with charities. We do community events, we do data dives. Think of it as a hackathon. One important lesson we've learned, by the way, about the hackathons, if we just turned up, got some data and tried to solve problems, we'd get nowhere, we'd spend 90% of our time munging data. Um, so what we do is we have a special kind of volunteer who go and work with charities for two months before the event so that when people turn up, the data is moderately clean and moderately sensible. But you can't solve all the problems of the world in a weekend, so we also run data core projects, which are six-month projects where volunteers get embedded with the charities to do work. We'll see what kind of impact that has later on. But just a reminder, why do we do data science? Why do we play with data? There are a bunch of answers. People are biased and inconsistent. People are really biased when it comes to decision making and particularly bad at it. Sometimes people are working in stress situations. Um, in the UK, in the health service, which is still at the moment free, although given the state of our government, I need to check on an hourly basis. Um, in the UK, our junior doctors, the ones in accident emergency, may be on shift for 48 hours. People in those kind of circumstances at the end of 40, hour 47 aren't necessarily making the best decisions in their lives, and yet they're making it about life and death decisions. People are bad at dealing with large volumes of data and complex data. Sometimes it's simply because we need to make a lot of decisions very rapidly. But fundamentally, we think, and I hope you'd agree with me, we think data science can provide better decisions and new insights. Okay, so those are the reasons why people should be doing data science. If that's the case, surely everyone would love data science. Okay, everyone would love this new things we can do with data. So as an experiment, uh, on Sunday I went to the website of one of the major newspapers in the United Kingdom, The Guardian, not least because it has a non-paywalled website, and I searched for artificial intelligence to see what came up. These are the artificial intelligence uh, articles they have for April, one month only. And you can see there's a wide variety of stuff here, right, starting from a picture of the Terminator, which I find particularly helpful, um, Cybersecurity in the, is the office coffee machine watching you? Now that's really ironic when the first webcam was totally about people watching a coffee machine. 
how artificial will change things. Rise of the sex robots, it's a newspaper, they've got to get people to read things. Um, Alibaba founder says AI will cause people more pain than happiness. Well, cheers for that. Um, why are we reluctant to trust robots? What if we're living in a computer simulation? Seems to be a little bit off on one side. Uh, EU publication, The Guardian saying things are great. Robots are racist and sexist. As long as they don't look like the one at the top left, we're probably okay. Science fiction, um, <laughs> great quote here. Robot, <laughs> robot future, they will pay as much attention to us as we do to ants. That should be making us feel very good about it. Uh, voter manipulation, and then computers reproducing bias. So we can see there that actually there is something of a collision going on here. Even in the minds of people who should know better, which are journalists, we have these big collisions going on. How do we break down that barrier? Well, we probably need to start thinking about some of the fundamental problems that underline that. Um, but slightly before we get, that, get to that point, how comfortable are you personally with AI and data science? I'm a bit of a science fiction geek. Okay, I like science fiction. So this gives me a great chance to talk about two excellent authors. Charles Stross, on the one hand, who is Scottish, and Ian M. Banks, on the other hand, who was Scottish. <laughs> Commonality there. So has, any, has anyone read any of the books by Ian Banks? Hands up. We've got a few, really, wow. This guy is great. So Ian Banks is undoubtedly a fan of the AI future. In his universe, we have uh, an organ, a, a, I was gonna say a culture called the culture, that doesn't make much sense. We have a pan-galactic civilization called the culture and essentially it is run by benevolent, yet sarcastic artificial intelligence who fly around in big warships um, with silly names, okay? Definitely a beneficial future for AI. At the other end of the scale, Charles Stross writes a wonderful set of comic books that imagine that essentially magic is simply mathematics. Which is fine as long as you've only got a few people who can do mathematics, but when anyone who codes can write up really complex equations, which turn out to be mathematics, life gets dangerous because the more magic you do, the more chance you have of the elder gods coming through from the other side of, of the universe and eating our brains. So he's definitely not a fan of AI in that sense. So I call this the, the Stross M. Banks continuum from AI will bring about the end of the world, it's all horrible, through to we will be ruled by benevolent AIs who will love us all. Have we activated the question? Nina is activating a question. So whereabouts on that spectrum do you fall? From one, they're gonna kill us all, through to seven, I love them, they love me back. And there's a bit of, a bit of insight. Uh, if you ask Elon Musk where he stood, I'm pretty certain Elon Musk is over here in the bank's end. How am I certain of that? He's named his landing barges after some of those AIs. Uh, read the instructions, and of course I still love you, are in fact two of the big uh, general contact unit AIs from the Ian Banks universe. So are you all voting? When I first started using this, which was only a month or so ago, I expected pretty much people to be all at one end because I was talking to a technology crowd and I got a mixed answer. So I'm gonna be interested to see how confident Berlin is in our, in our AI overlords. How are we doing on votes? Still going on? Well, in the meantime, we can watch the landing of this because this is wonderful. The more I watch this, the happier I feel. Do we have some answers then? How confident are we? 4% of you think we'll, they'll kill us all. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, what's the biggest one? Where are we sitting? Five. Okay, so as you might expect, uh, there is a distribution here. Uh, it's normal-ish. Big tip to those of you in data, you don't really see normal distributions in the real world. They exist for mass textbooks, by and large. Uh, but it's normal-ish distribution, and the peak is about five. So on the balance, on balance, we're moderately more comfortable in the AI future than we are uncomfortable. So that's good news. Now, in the old days, <laughs> back in the 90s, when we talked about technology adoption, we talked about this plot. Has everyone seen this before? 
Hands up, well, I need some, I, I, you know, I can hardly see you anyway. Uh, if you've seen this graph before, say yes. yes. If you're looking at this in confusion, say no. Okay, a little bit of description then. This is called crossing the chasm. It came from some work by Jeffrey Moore, amongst others. And the idea is that in technology adoption, we have this curve of users. On the far left-hand side, we have the innovators and early adopters. Let's think of this in terms of phone technology. The innovators and early adopters buy everything as soon as it comes out. The innovators particularly, they like things because they're cool and bleeding edge. The innovators buy the latest Android phone, but they don't keep Android on it. They throw Android off it, they root it, they put some Linux kernel thing, and it doesn't work. They can't receive calls, but they love it because it's cool. Okay. I've got a feeling we've got some innovators in the audience today. <laughs> well, we'll find out. They're the ones who are going, I can't get this browser to work. <laughs> the early adopters are a bit similar. They like things slightly more stable. So there you're talking you know, the latest version of the latest phones. They'll, the innovators and the early adopters will get the latest Android when it comes out. They'll get the latest iPhone when it comes out. Then you have the early majority. I view those as the iPhone 6 era. You have the late majority, 5, 5S. The laggards, Nokia 3310. Okay. Now, the challenge in technologist terms is, of course, that the gap between the early adopters, who are quite happy to have stuff that's flaky and doesn't work and falls over, and the early majority, where they want stuff that's solid, is a big gap to cross if you're trying to build up a company. One of the challenges with data science is that the technology has let that gap without consent. Data science and data analysis is everywhere. Facebook runs on it, eBay runs on it, Amazon runs on it, and it's doing it without necessarily pulling the population with it. So we can start to think about this in a different way. We can think about how the process might work from data to decisions. There are actually far, far better process diagrams than this. The one I would recommend is CRISPR-DM, but there are others out there. But in an idealized world, we can imagine that we start with some data. We push the data into some algorithms, they generate some models. We pull in some more data. That generates yet more data. I like data. And then finally, we get to making some decisions. Okay. Now, of course, in the real world, this is highly iterative. Things never work out correctly, etc. The challenge we're facing is that for most people, there's a wall here. Most people sit on this side. They receive the output of decisions. And they have no insight at all into what's happening along there. They often have very little participation in it. And yet, people increasingly want to see beyond that wall. They want to understand what's going on there. In fact, I'd argue there is far too much focus on the left-hand side, and not nearly enough on the right-hand side, the decision side. Why might this be a problem at all? Because surely, you know, either an algorithm is good or it's evil. Turns out, of course, it's not as simple as that. So going back to the survey of data science salaries that O'Reilly did, uh, they did a fun thing here. They decided to do a survey of data science salaries. They went out and asked people what they were earning. And they asked them a bunch of other questions as well, you know, what kind of education you had, how old you are. But they gave it to data scientists, which was a fatal mistake. Because the data scientists thought, well, I've got all this data, I'm going to throw it at an algorithm. In this case, they just used some simple regression. But they built this model out. And this model is really quite fun. Because if you're one of the 10% who work in data science, this tells you how much you should be paid, which is quite nice. Also, you notice the numbers are reasonably large. A $70,000 intercept is a starting point. So they built this out. I now have an algorithm I can apply to the real world. Well, how can I use that? The first way I can use it is I can use it to do good, personal good. So I can look through this and I can go, well, if I go to Europe, my salary will be $23,000 lower. So, right, I won't move to Europe, that's great. Secondly, I'll vote to leave the European Union. That will stop the spread of this European nonsense. <sighs> oh, for God's sake. I mean, for the record, sorry, the whole European Union thing. <laughs> we thought we were crazy then, then the US took crazy off us, they took the crazy crown with electing Trump, and we've hit right back at them with our latest election. I'm just waiting to see what Don... Oh, that would be really bad. Okay. So, good news. I have a positive use for this. This is actually a good, positive algorithm. Or is it? Well, yes, I can do even more good. Look here, if I spot 
this factor, totally, totally wrong thing. I mean, this is something that's driven from actually what they saw in the data. It turns out that when you explore the data, it says that if you're a woman, you're likely to be paid $8,000 less than if you're a man, for no reason whatsoever other than the fact you're a woman. So, good news, my algorithm has spotted this, so I can now take action. And I can now use this to actually start thinking about how I can actually appropriately um, compensate women in data science. Now, it's got to be said that actually, although it's 8,000 less, that's better than in many industries, it's still not good enough. So, great, my algorithm is still working for good. Or is it? Because I can use that same data in a different way. If I'm employing people, I can now use this to say, well, actually, I'm going to make sure that when a woman applies, I'm not going to overpay them. I know that I can offer them a lower salary and they'll still come on board. It's the same equation. I haven't changed it, and yet I'm now using it for evil. Or I can get very confused, and I really don't know the answer to this. Imagine I was, on the other hand, I was advising people who were making hiring decisions. <laughs> Now what do I do? I have some information in my hand which says, well, actually, I could tell you, you don't need to offer them as much money, but that would clearly be evil. Or I could use this to say, well, actually, you shouldn't be offering them less money. And it's, it's much more complex than that. And yet, this is the same algorithm. So the idea that the algorithm itself is good or is evil is not as straightforward as it might seem. And that brings me on to the first crucial point. It's not just the algorithm, it's actually the decisions that you use the algorithm for. And those decisions are often removed from the people who build the models, which is a problem. Often the people who build the models don't even think about the outcome. They just see some cool data. And I used to ask a question, which we'd have a series of options about really cool analysis, and we'd ask people which is the coolest, and people would quite happily answer that question without thinking about should I be doing any of these? So what are the challenges this throws up? Clearly challenges around consent are there. Challenges around transparency. Accuracy, understanding prediction, and above all, communication. So if we have all those challenges, where should we go for options and answers? The first, question, first thing we might want to do is go to the government. Uh, and here I'm going to, um, we're going to try something different. We won't be able to show you the answers of this live because it's going to probably word cloud, which isn't my favorite thing. You hit four. Ask a question here. When you think about government and data laws, what's the first word that comes to your mind? And as far as I'm aware, the website isn't censored, so any answer you give will be in there. And it'll be a good opportunity for me to learn about more about German swear words, I think. So. Can we rely on governments and laws? Whilst you're entering that, let's look at a great example of some uh, laws around AI. Here we go. Does anyone recognize these? It just by the way, one of the fun things from this is it shows how out-of-date science fiction can go very, very quickly. It's talking about the 56th edition of the Handbook of Robotics in, well, only 41 years. <laughs> As far as I can see, the latest version of the Handbook of Robotics is on about edition two. So we've got a lot of editions we've got to pack up into the next few years to get that back on track. So these are Isaac Asimov's laws of robotics. And he kind of created these conceptual laws in an attempt to um, say, if you have these, then everything would be great in the world of robots. And what they are are, broadly speaking, you can't hurt people. Uh, you've got to obey orders. And then you must protect yourself. So did that work? Well, not really. Isaac Asimov made a great career for himself writing books about how those laws didn't work. Okay. Those are about the most straightforward and simple set of laws you can imagine. Any real-world laws are inevitably more complicated. Uh, we have, um, uh, coming up, we have, of course, the GDPR, which sounds like a rogue German state. Um, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation will be coming into effect next year and is inherently complicated and only deals with some aspects of data. It certainly doesn't deal with all of the aspects of algorithmic transparency. So some real, real challenges about that. My opinion is that laws don't work. At least they don't work for data in terms of providing equitable and fair solutions. Partly because fairness isn't really a 
legal construct. It's very hard to create a legal construct of fairness. Fairness is something we all kind of have in our guts. We kind of look at something and we say that's fair or that isn't fair. But coming to a definition of what that might be is very challenging. The reason is, well, actually, and very importantly, fairness and accuracy don't go hand in hand. I can build an incredibly accurate model which is not at all fair. It's accurate because it reflects the data that's fed into it. In the world of data science, we talk about collinearity, the fact that various metrics are closely related. So, for example, if we go to the US, income and ethnic um, background are highly correlated. The reality is if you're from an African-American background, you are far less likely to earn a lot of money than if you are from a Caucasian background. So if I just look at race, I see one thing, but if I look at income, I will see pretty much the same picture. And disentangling those things is very difficult. In social science, we call this intersectionality. It's the idea that actually um, these factors of disadvantage tend to be highly interlinked and trying to extract them is difficult. Our dear friends in the European Union, for example, tried to do this a while ago. They said uh, that it was illegal to use gender as a basis for making insurance decisions. So in car insurance, it used to be the case that you would basically create a car insurance company that said, oh, like Sheila's Wheels was a great example. Sheila's Wheels was set up in the UK specifically to target women. Why? Because women, by and large, drive more safely than men. Okay? We know this because the insurance industry has lots of data. Women, for whatever reason, crash their cars less often than us. And when they do crash them, by the way, they tend to be less damage involved. It's not a crash at 90 miles an hour on a motorway, it's a fender bender in the car park. So the EU said you can no longer do this. You can't say, are you a man or a woman? Guess how much impact that had on the insurance industry? Absolutely zero. Two reasons. Firstly, although you can't explicitly say, are you a man or are you a woman, you can still advertise as Sheila's Wheels okay, <laughs> and say, we are about women, this is what we do, and you have uh, advertising that clearly says only women would apply for this. The second reason is, of course, all I need to do is look at other factors that correlate with, some, with whether or not someone is a woman. So I can look at what time of day do you drive, what car do you drive. If I'm really cunning, what I do is I put a box into your car which looks at your driving behavior and I say, you may or may not be a woman, but you drive like a woman. Okay? Actually, that's probably the safest way of doing it, you know, because that's what you're really interested in. Do people drive in a safe way? So that intersectionality is crucial there and makes life really difficult. And I'm going to look through a couple of real-world problems here. And these really are examples drawn from the real world. Sometimes when I'm uh, at uh, other conferences, I do a talk I call Using Data for Evil. So I use the same examples, but I say you should do this if you want to do evil. But let's try and take the good out of these. The first one is some work that's been done in the US. I, I should emphasize here I'm not deliberately picking on the United States. It's easy at the moment, I know, but I'm trying not to. This is some work that was done. There is a professional company there that produced a piece of software that actually tries to predict if someone who is in the system is likely to commit a further crime if they're released. And this is really important in bail decisions. So I have a bunch of people in jail. I want to know, before their trial, can I let them out on bail, or should I keep them in for the safety of the community? The difficulty is that this system is racially biased. It tends to deny bail or recommend that bail is denied more for African Americans than it does for white Americans. And there's some great analysis of this. Cathy O'Neill, who, who runs the website mathbabe.org, has done a lot of stuff about this. I strongly recommend you look up her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. If nothing else, it's got a great title. So this is a hugely problematic thing. Why is it doing this? It's doing this because or at least partly because the data that is fed to it reflects the decisions that are already being made. And the decisions that are already being made are inherently racist. They have aspects, for example, where does someone live? Do they come from a community that has lots of crime? Well, crime is associated with low incomes, and what did I say about low incomes? They're related to ethnic diversity or ethnic uh, background, uh, and that's linked to poverty. And it's, this whole thing is, is kind of deeply entwined, and extracting that and trying to make it 
less racist is challenging. And the specific challenges here, if you feed an algorithm racist, based, racist data, people say it will inevitably be racist. And most real-world data is biased in one way or another. Another thing that people say is a challenge is that um, algorithmic unfairness is inherently worse than human unfairness. Which is a bit interesting to me. I'm not certain I believe that. And the other argument, of course, is we should therefore make algorithms transparent. If I could look into that box, if I could understand what was going on, then I'd be able to see in advance, is this algorithm a good algorithm or a bad algorithm? I'm not convinced. Firstly, I'm not convinced about the first statement. If you feed an algorithm racist data, it will inevitably be racist. In data science, we spend a lot of time trying to balance data sets. We spend a lot of time trying to remove biases. And the real question to my mind isn't, is it racist or is it not racist? It's simply incremental. Does this algorithm make things better than they were before? If I already had a racist system, can I make a slightly less racist system? Surely that's a step forward. Are algorithmic is algorithmic unfairness inherently worse than human unfairness? My straightforward answer to that is no. At the end of the day, does it matter what makes the decision? What really matters is the decision itself. And let me illustrate that going back to this, this picture. Remember we have this notional, totally untrue process that leads to some decisions. And I've got the gap here, or a wall. Let's go back to Alan Turing. Alan Turing said exactly the same thing. Imagine you have a wall, you have a room over there, inside that room is something, it's answering questions. I don't know what that thing is. Can I tell whether it's a human or not a human? That's the Alan Turing approach. In this case, I'm going to say, can I tell if it's an algorithm or a box of frogs? It's a lovely picture of a, a, a hallowed British icon having a frog jump on his face. At the end of the day, imagine that. I have a judge behind the wall or I have an algorithm behind the wall. Does it really matter? What matters is the decision and is the decision itself problematic? And sometimes the language we use doesn't help. So we've been talking about algorithmic bias. But perhaps it's better to think about differential impact. So once I've made these decisions, what is the impact they are having? Is that impact fair or unfair? And if we're going to think about that, we need to actually think carefully about what we mean in terms of differential impact. My starting point would be understand the baseline. What's happening now? What are the decisions that are being made now like in terms of overall response rates, in terms of accuracy, but in terms of how they impact different sectors of society. And we need to think about type 1 and type 2 errors. Does everyone know what type 1 and type 2 errors are? Does anyone know what type 1 and type 2 errors are? Yes, if you do. No, if you don't. Ooh. So this is the great thing about talking to people who aren't data scientists. If I, if I do this in a data science lecture, then I, I'm nervous, terrified that I'll get type 1 and type 2 the wrong way around. So there's more than one way you can be wrong. This is the great insight. Uh, you can be wrong by predicting something is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. Or you can be wrong by predicting something isn't going to happen, and it then happens. When you first start playing with type 1 and type 2 errors, usually you assume that they have the same cost. But in reality, they often have very, very different costs. If any of you are involved in marketing, imagine it this way. Uh, there's a probability that Nina will buy a Ferrari, okay? It's a low probability, yes? Yeah, she's assuring me it's a low probability, but there's a probability. On that basis, I could predict that she's going to buy a Ferrari when she's not. So I send out the marketing material, maybe because it's a Ferrari, that'd be quite nice marketing material, and she doesn't buy the Ferrari. What's the cost? It's the cost of the marketing material. So that's a, I don't know, I, let's say that's a type 1 error. I can't remember if that's the right way around, but let's assume it is. The type 2 error is the other one. I predict that Nina isn't going to buy a Ferrari, but actually she just won the lottery. She's got you know, 133 million euros in her back pocket, and she really wants to buy a Ferrari. So I don't send her the marketing. Great, I've saved 10 euros in marketing costs. But what I've lost is the uh, Ferrari la Ferrari, what, 1 million euros in revenue I would have made if I'd taken that decision. So that's the difference, cost difference. And when we're talking about social impact, we need to think what that means. 
The cost of offering someone bail when they would go on to commit a crime is the social cost of the crime and probably the court cost of then having to drag the person in, etc. The cost of not offering someone bail if they weren't going to commit the crime is twofold. Firstly, there's the actual cost of keeping them in jail, but then there's also the social cost to that person, that person's family, of having them in jail when actually they were perfectly safe to get out. And I need to understand those differentials and think about those when I start building my decisioning. We also need to think about a third cost, which is the cost of doing nothing. Because the alternative might be, let's abandon this, let's stop using data science, instead let's go back to having judges. Which means that things will slow down. Well, the cost of that is that there are many more people for whom decisions are not being made. And that's a cost to them as well. All those negative costs of not letting people out on bail start stacking up. So we need to bear that in mind when we're thinking about decisioning. So if that was a, a complex case, the next one is relatively simple. And you can look this up, uh, just search for OKCupid OK and data release and it will come up. This was a, a wonderful thing that some social scientists did. They were really interested in understanding social interactions. They looked at the world and they found there was this dating site called OKCupid. Okay and it had lots of data that was in the public domain because for a dating site to work, your data has to be in the public domain. There's no point in going onto a dating site and having a hidden profile. It doesn't work that way. So top tip, if you are on a dating site, public profile. Okay. The challenge then is that people could actually view that data. And what these people did is they actually scraped the data from OKCupid, okay um, probably by setting up a fake user and going in. And they took that data and they did some analysis, but then they thought, this is a really great resource. Let's put it out there on the web so that people can use it as a future resource. <laughs> okay. So some huge problems there. What's more, they did this under this wonderful uh, smoke screen. They said, we're being ethical because this is open science. We're putting it out there so people can use our results and test against them. But clearly, they haven't thought about the issue of consent. Consent is a very challenging thing because consent in legal terms, it's yes or no, but in practice, we often have differential layers of consent. It's one thing to actually put your profile on a dating site, but when you do that, you do it in the assumption that it's going to be looked at by people who may or may not want to date you, not by some social scientists. Um, they published this sensitive data, and the other real challenge here is they actually made the Digital Millennium Copyright Act look quite good because people use that to get the data taken down. <laughs> it's about the only positive thing I've had to say about the DMCA. Here's one of the challenges we have from consent in terms of data analysis. Consent assumes consent can be made as a one-off time in an informed way. And in terms of marketing consent, that's probably true. But in terms of data analysis, it certainly isn't, because I don't know today what analysis I might do on the data I'm gathering. And it's impossible for me to, at some point in the future, go backwards in time to collect data. If I'm going to collect data, I need to collect it now. So perhaps we need to think about splitting consent into two phases. Consent for data to be used for analysis, which can be gathered now and will tend to be rather broad, anonymized hopefully, but rather broad. And then consent for data decisioning, which inevitably is not anonymized because I need to do something with the decision, but which can be gathered at a later stage. And I think this is really important when we think about the social uses of data. Imagine I'm gathering data for a health project. Okay, I want to understand the factors that lead up to certain illnesses. Well, if I'm doing that, I need to have data not just at the time you turn up at the doctor's surgery or the hospital being ill, because that doesn't tell me what you were like beforehand. And it doesn't give me a control group. And this is where I stray into some personal opinion. My personal view is that opting out of data consent for analysis and expecting to benefit from herd immunity is not a nice ethical position to be in. There are some people who've got genuine reasons for doing it. Okay? You have a genuine fear of persecution, absolutely no problem. But for most people, opting out of data consent for analysis is like opting out of inoculation and expecting to benefit from the herd immunity. It is problematic. On what grounds should I be allowed to benefit from the new discoveries in medicine if I'm not willing to participate in that research in any way without valid reason? My third example, and you'll be pleased to know last, 
from this section, is thinking about something that the UK government, if such a thing exists this morning, uh, wanted Facebook to do. So in the UK, we have a long and honourable tradition of terrorism. Okay? It's been going on for many years. We had a lot of it in the 70s and 80s with the IRA, and it's coming back. And one of the things that the UK government is trying to do is it's trying to push the online social media sites to do more. And at one point, they said, what Facebook should do, and they pick on Facebook for no really explained reason, but say, what Facebook should do is it should look through all posts and it should predict which ones are from terrorists. And for those terrorists, it should send us the details so we can go around and arrest them. Nice idea. There are some challenges, though. The first one is the maths doesn't work, and that's really quite a big one. So I'm going to set you a, a little maths question here, and you can activate it. So back to your Slido here. Imagine, there is a big clue, by the way. The photo is a big clue. Does any, don't, answer, don't give the answer out. Does anyone know what that picture is of? One person, don't tell anyone yet. We'll come back to that in a second. Unless you're just saying it's a grave. That's not very helpful. Okay. So here's the maths you need to do. Imagine I'm Facebook. I build a model that is 99.9% .9 accurate at predicting if a post is from a terrorist. So, I have 100 active terrorists in the UK, let's assume. I have 60 million people in the UK, again, let's assume. And my model is 99.9% .9 accurate. So your question is, if the model predicts I'm a terrorist, how likely is it that I actually am a terrorist? Okay. Now, I'll give you a few moments to answer that um, whilst I explain what the picture is. The picture is actually a grave in... Uh, Bunhill Fields in London. This is the grave of Thomas Bayes. Okay? Thomas Bayes was an 18th century uh, preacher. He wasn't a mathematician. But in the 18th century, if you were a preacher, basically you had very little to do. You kind of did your services on a Sunday. You buried a few people. You married a few people. You had a lot of spare time on your hands. So an awful lot of them decided that they wanted to do mathematics as a spare time hobby. And Thomas Bayes um, did this in his spare time. And when he died his friends found a paper that he'd never had published because he was an amateur, and British amateur people don't do that kind of thing. And they got together and they published a paper in 1763, and that became the basis of what we now call Bayesian statistics. Okay? So Bayesian statistics takes in priors into account. And that's really important in terms of this particular piece of maths. Do we have an answer? We have an answer. Sixty-eight percent say 0.17 percent. Oh, sorry, 17. Mm. 0.17 percent. 0.17, yeah. Can I say I, I want to give you all a round of applause for being, without doubt, the most educated team I have ever come across. Sixty-eight percent of you got the right answer. The right answer is 0.17 percent. How many people said 99.9 percent? Four percent of you need to think a bit more carefully about this. The reason it is so low, the reason it's such a low number, is effectively around false positives. So for every terrorist you correctly identify, you, I falsely positive, you false positively identify a whole bunch of non-terrorists. Is that a problem? If you're living in a police state, it probably isn't a problem. But if you're living in a police state, why use evidence at all? That's not how police states work. They just arrest people because they can. Um, if you sent that to our security service, they would be swamped with inaccurate data. And they would have so many cases they couldn't deal with it. So it's very, very problematic. And the reality, of course, is that people are very bad at understanding maths. People are even worse at understanding statistics. And we have this interesting balance between explicability and accuracy. Eek, I'm running out of time. Explicability versus accuracy. The more accurate I make a model, and now we have wonderful techniques like support vector machines, uh, random forests, deep learning, they can produce very accurate results, and we'll see some wonderful examples later in the day. But explaining them is almost impossible. And if you want to look at some of the reasons behind why people are bad at maths, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is a great starting point. So what can we do about uh, bridging this gap then? Thinking about decisions. Think before you analyze. Don't just do an, an analysis because you can. Think about why I should do that and the impacts. Think about communicating it and take personal responsibility. There is one other thing we can do. 
And that's to get out there and act as positive examples of what data science could do in the real world. And for this, I'll come back to DataKind. So DataKind, we are a charity. We work around the world. We have a team in Bangalore, Singapore, the UK, Ireland, um, DC, San Francisco, New York. We don't yet have a group in Germany. But you can take these ideas and run with them. And very briefly, here's a story of a small charity we worked for in England called The Key. They work with young people not in education, employment, or training. And their goal is to give those young people opportunities. They do it through projects. A young person can apply. They can say, I want to do a project. And the project can be anything. But by going through the project, they learn skills along the way, and hopefully that helps them get into employment. When they first started working with us, there were seven people in this charity, a very small organization. Their eighth employee was a data scientist. And these are some of the things they're doing at the moment. A, B testing. So one of the concerns is that the project could be anything. It could be reciting a Shakespeare play, or it could be going out to the cinema with friends. They A, B tested that to see if it made any difference in terms of the actual outcomes for the individuals, and lo and behold, it didn't. And that was really useful for them, because now they could go back to funders and say, I know you really want to, to fund projects which involve Shakespeare, but actually, don't worry about it. The skills people learn are just as good when they do other things. They're doing survival analysis. They work through people who volunteer to mentor young people. Their survival analysis showed that if they didn't get those people into projects quickly after training, then the likelihood of them getting involved was much lower. So they actually built out that model and understood that they need to intervene very quickly. And they're working on sharing this data. So no longer does the data sit within their organization. They feed that data back to the organizations they work with and also back to their mentors and their users. So the users can see their own data. But in DataKind, we've learned some important lessons along the way. The first one is that sometimes projects work like this. They start off looking like a snail, and then they're gone. They take off. Other times, projects are a bit like this. <laughs> okay. They don't work. What were the key lessons then? The first one, finding good problems can be challenging, much tougher than finding solutions. It's almost always worth spending extra time getting the question right. There's a big tendency in the data science community, if you give me data and a problem, I will just throw the data at a neural network and see what happens. Stop. Step back. Think. And particularly in social situations, think about the outcomes. Think about the predictions and the impact. The second thing we learned was that communication is as important or more important than technology. And you'll probably experience this in your lives as well. If you have the coolest solution ever, but you can't explain it to the CEO, it's probably never going to happen. And the same is true in the world of uh, social data analysis. No matter how cool and insightful and interesting the analysis is, if I can't bring the charity along with me, they are not going to do anything. And when we're talking about the broader picture, this means bringing along society with us. We can have some really cool insight, we can have some really cool stuff, but if people do not trust it, it will not happen and it will cause problems. Which links in very close into the idea of working with social organizations and charities, not for them. Don't come in and say, I can solve all your problems because you know what, and this is my obligatory XKCD cartoon, you know what, that's tough. If this problem's been around for years, the chances of you being able to solve it instantly and effectively are very low. We do this in DataKind by ensuring that the charities come along to our events, that they participate in the events, that throughout the process we explain what we're doing, or we try to, um, and get their insight into what the data means and what impact this will have in the real world because there is a huge amount of stuff to do. And I've been talking about the impact of data analysis and data science. And some of you will be saying, 80% of you will be saying, hey, we're coders, this isn't us. But actually, there are other organizations who think about coding for social good. Well, I absolutely recommend you get involved. And I, remember, I know that um, yesterday Karen was talking about donating to, to not-for-profits. 
But don't think about donating just in terms of money, because frankly, we can go to eBay and MapR and things, and we can ask them for money, and they have more money than you, well, eBay certainly have more money than you do. I can't speak for startups and people working in the tech space. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But what they don't have is the ability to give time, and you do. You can take your skill and your expertise and actually make a real difference in society, because we have 2,000 volunteers in the UK. That does mean that some weekends when we're running a hackathon, we are the biggest data science team in the entire country. But there are still more problems out there than we can face. So the final thing I will leave you with, you'll be pleased to know, is something I tried to put together a number of years ago. Because again, Karen talked to us about the engineering code. And I tried to put together a data science code, and no one paid any attention to it, and I don't have a nice steel ring or anything. Nevertheless, the principles behind this are pretty important. Because following this through really helps. Be aware of what you're working on and the impact of that. Don't sit in an office thinking, actually, I'm just doing some, cool, some really cool maths. What you're doing might have an impact. Be aware of the impact. Don't be arrogant. Don't just do things because you can. It's a real temptation out there. I can do these super cool things. And you see this in the West Coast, Silicon Valley. It's called solutionism. The idea, I'll go out and solve problems because that's my skill set. I will disrupt things. You know, if another person comes out and says, I'm going to disrupt the, the X industry. Don't do it just because you can. But then, don't, it's not just about not doing things, it's also about being positive. Be an agent for change. Understand that you have a unique set of skills that are in huge demand in the social sector or in the government sector. There aren't people with, you know, if, if we looked at these combined salaries of everyone in this room, huge. The social sector cannot afford that. By volunteering your time in a sensible, focused way, you could have a huge impact as individuals, and that's really amazing. Which brings on to the slight Americanism here. Sorry, I was writing this uh, whilst in America. Be awesome. Re reach out to organizations. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go to them. Say, I have these really great skills. I could help you if you can tell me what you need to be done. And sorry for the alliteration, um, my forays of data science. Um, but hopefully that gives you, well, inspiration might be too strong a word, but hopefully someone, someone in this audience will actually start thinking, wait a minute, I could do this. Because that's how we started DataKind in the UK. I saw a talk by Jake Porway in the US, and I tried to get him to come to the UK and do stuff, and he was far too busy. And in the end I thought, I'm just gonna have to do it myself. And that's how we started DataKind in the UK. Anyone in the room could be the one person who goes and does that in Berlin or in Munich or wherever. You all have immense power. Use that power for good. Last thing, you can go back and if you want, you can retake this. We'll reopen this and see if people have become more or less assured um, on the Stross M Banks continuum. Final look at the beautiful landing of that spaceship. It's always worth looking at that. I mean, that's an amazing piece of... Uh, engineering. But with that, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm Duncan Ross, been talking about DataKind. Go out, do good. Thank you. <laughs>